So welcome to the last lecture in this course on Gaussian random fields and machine learning. Today we will talk about efficient algorithms for sampling and conditioning uh, Gaussian processes. Uh, I want to remind you that in that last time we have seen a couple of um, simple algorithms that allow us to sample from Gaussian processes and condition them and do predictions with them. Um, and we found out that they have um, unfavorable uh, com computational complexity. So in this talk, I will uh, try to explain you how we can build algorithms which are more, more efficient, but um, which uh, lead to a slight loss of accuracy because they're all built on the idea of approximating the process that we uh, use. So first in this lecture, I will be talking about efficiently sampling a stationary Gaussian process, uh, a special kind of Gaussian processes that uh, is very popular uh, choice for priors or unconditional processes in machine learning. Um, then uh, I will talk about sampling from a conditional Gaussian processes for which the unconditional, the corresponding unconditional process is uh, stationary. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, I will talk about uh, efficiently conditioning uh, Gaussian processes. So, and Yet after that, there will be conclusion to the whole um, to this whole course. So um, let me first define what the stationary Gaussian process is, and um, before that, uh, to say that in this lecture, from now on, um, we will assume that our set T over which the Gaussian process is defined is uh, some d-dimensional Euclidean space. So we're indeed talking about Gaussian random fields. So now a, a random process is called stationary if its distribution is unaffected by shifts. So formally, we can write this as follows, that these marginal distributions coincide uh, given any set of these t's and any t. Uh, we shift and nothing changes. Uh, in the special case where x is a Gaussian process because its distribution is determined by only mean function and covariance function, uh, we only need uh, a them to satisfy these conditions. So first of all, uh, mean function should be should not change under shifts, uh, which obviously leads to uh, the condition that it's simply some constant. And then uh, covariance function uh, should not change under shifts, and uh, this just means that it's it depends only on the difference of its arguments. So this k of t t prime is equal to kappa of t minus t prime for some function kappa. Um, we have already seen an example of stationary Gaussian process and an example of non-stationary Gaussian process. Um, Gaussian process with RBF kernel, which uh, I have shown in the previous lecture, was stationary. Uh, if you recall what was the formula for its kernel, you can clearly see that it depends only on the difference between the arguments and thus it's stationary. And uh, its mean function is usually assumed to be zero. So it's a constant and there is no problem with that. Uh, now, an example of non-stationary process that we have already seen is the Brownian motion. Um, recall that its covariance function is just the minima between uh, t and t prime. And uh, from this, we can see that, for example, 
k of 0, 0 is equal to 0, well, k of 1, 1 is equal to 1. And uh, of course, the difference between 0 and 0 in the 1 and 1 is the same. So this should be equal if it, if it would have to be stationary, but it's not, so it's not stationary. Um, this uh, is more or less consequence of the very simple principle that uh, for a stationary process, it should have constant variance. And uh, I rem uh, remind you that variance is just k t t. So for different t, this value should be the same and it's not for Brownian motion. Um, so these um, stationary processes are special because uh, a kind of Fourier analysis holds for them and uh, there are uh, special representations which are called spectral representations both for covariance function and for the process itself. Uh, I will start by describing what is a spectral representation of covariance function. And uh, so to do this, I will define this kappa as uh, a one parameter covariance function. So it's just something that summarizes function k uh, in the case where k is uh, stationary. Of course, if k is stationary, then you can uh, recover the original k from function kappa. Um, so there is this uh, theorem called Bochner's theorem um, that says that if kappa is positive definite, meaning that the corresponding k is a positive definite function, then there exists a unique, uh, a unique finite and positive measure mu such that this kappa is the Fourier transform of this measure mu. Uh, mu is called in this case the spectral measure of uh, covariance function kappa or covariance function k or the process for which k is covariance function. Um, and um, if this measure mu has some density with respect to Lebesgue measure, then it's called uh, the spectral density. And also the converse statement holds as well. So if our function um, kappa is uh, of this form, so it's a Fourier transform of some finite positive measure, then uh, it's a positive definite uh, function and uh, it is that's a kernel of some stationary Gaussian process. Um, one example uh, of spectral measure uh, that we can easily see, uh, that we can easily compute is uh, again for this RBF kernel. Uh, function kappa of tau is as follows for this uh, kernel and uh, uh, since it's a Gaussian function, and since Fourier transform has a Gaussian function as its uh, fixed point, uh, we have that um, the spectral density is again a Gaussian function. So because it has some parameters associated to it, uh, the spectral density will also have these parameters, but they will be different. So it's, it, it is a different Gaussian but still the function of the same form. <clears throat> so now to define a uh, spectral representation of uh, the process itself, I would need to introduce the formal definition of a kind of random measure and a stochastic integral. Uh, let me consider some measure space as a mu where s is a set, a is some sigma algebra and mu is a finite po positive measure. Then a family of complex values random variables uh, indexed by sets from a that satisfy uh, three following condition. Uh, first, uh, that they all have zero expectation 
next that their correlation that the correlation uh, that covariance between uh, two values of this f for different sets is equal to the measure mu here this measure mu of the intersection of two sets and as a consequence of this we have that uh, if a1 doesn't intersect a2 then um, f of a1 is not uh, correlated to f of a2 and also we have uh, additivity property like for measures only that holds uh, almost surely so this object this family um, of random variables is called a centered random measure with uncorrelated values and it should be considered like a, a whole term so it's not um, it, it's it's a whole name for this object um, we say that measure mu here is the intensity measure of this centered random measure with uncorrelated values um, so with respect to this random measure we can define the integral uh, for uh, starting from simple functions of this form so this is just a linear combination of some sets ag with uh, deterministic coefficients we can define the integral with respect to this uh, measure mu which is not measure but just for the shortness i will call it the measure uh, we can define this integral through this sum obviously and then um, it's rather easy using this property uh, to prove that uh, the operator which maps a function f to this integral will be isometric in the sense that the inner product between two functions f1 f2 in the space l2 uh, corresponding to measure mu the intensity measure here um, is equal to covariance between these two random variables and um, covariance um, between two random variables is um, inner product uh, for a space of random variables with the zero mean uh, that have uh, that have uh, finite variance so this is again some l2 space and we have uh, that sending a function to its integral is uh, sending it uh, to the space of uh, random variables then since this operator is an isometry it's obviously an a bounded operator and we can use this to extend this definition to any function f from this space saving of course the isometry property so now um, we have this stochastic integral with respect to any centered random measure with uncorrelated values uh, for any function of this l2 corresponding to measure mu. Um, so now we are ready to define a spectral representation of stationary Gaussian process. Um, so, no, not yet, actually, not yet. So, first, I want you to consider this um, uh, example. So, let F be some uh, centered random measure with related values, which is Gaussian at least in the sense that it's a real part and it's imaginary part are Gaussian. And then um, denoting its in intensity measure by mu, we can define uh, this object y of t. We can define it through this kind of integral. Uh, the function, uh, this complex exponential is this in the space L2, uh, L2 of mu because uh, simply uh, mu is a finite measure and this is a binary bounded function so it's well defined and uh, it is rather easy to prove that uh, this y of t will always be gaussian if f is gaussian to begin with 
So I leave it as an exercise. Uh, then, thanks to the isometry pro property of the integral, uh, we can compute covariance between two values of y. And uh, it will be equal to the inner product of two complex exponentials with respect to this measure mu. So using the basic property of uh, uh, complex exponentials, we just uh, get this thing integrated over measure mu. And uh, we see that this is just some function which is uh, um, which does which uh, does only depend on the difference of t minus t prime. Um, and uh, we can use the converse statement of Bochner's theorem to get that um, this uh, integral as a function of this t minus t prime is a positive definite function and thus y is a stationary Gaussian process. So given some uh, Gaussian centered random measure within correlated values, we can construct a stationary Gaussian process uh, more or less as its Fourier transform. Um, why without transposition? Uh, yeah, yeah, so we should have transpose here. You're right. Uh, it's just a misprint. Um, yeah, so from measure, we can go to stationary process. And uh, uh, the remarkable fact is that uh, we can go again the other way around. For any stationary process, there exists uh, some uh, measure of this kind such that this process can be represented in this way. Moreover, uh, this uh, measure F can be described uh, rather well in terms of the spectral measure of the corresponding to the kernel of this process. So if F is a random measure corresponding to our process, then it will be of this form. So it's a complex valued measure, uh, but both its real and uh, imaginary component will be, will be normally distributed with zero mean and uh, with the uh, variance, which can be computed from the spectral measure. And uh, also for every set A, we would have that real and imaginary part uh, are not correlated. And for non-intersecting non sets A and B, uh, we have that these things are not correlated. So uh, if we evaluate U at two different non-intersecting sets, we get something uncorrelated. If we do so, uh, the same thing with V, the same happens and same happens with U and V like uh, cross correlations. So we can use this to obtain some uh, useful approximation of some of a stationary Gaussian process, which will allow us to sample its process approximately, but much more efficiently than uh, the algorithm that we have seen yesterday. So assume that X with some covariance K is a stationary Gaussian process uh, with spectral measure mu. Uh, I want to know that in, in practice, uh, we usually know the spectral density in closed form. So for the unconditional uh, Gaussian process for prior, we usually use some simple covariance and uh, it's so simple that um, we can explicitly compute its Fourier transform in the form of uh, some formula. So now how can we get this approximation? Uh, consider some partition of the whole space into a finite number of sets and uh, some points um, fixed in each of these sets. Um, 
then we can write uh, our process through the, its uh, spectral decomposition and um, through its spectral representation. And then we can use the additivity property of our integral, which calls for random measures as well, uh, to represent it as this sum of integrals over specific sets AJ. Now, the approximation is as follows. We assume that this function is constant on AJ as if U would be equal to UJ. So approximating um, this integral in this way, we get this sum. Here are functions that doesn't depend on U, so they depend only on, on UJ and they're extracted from the integral. And uh, the integral, as we can see in the next equation, is turned into simply into this random measure of sets AJ because here we have only one, if, you, if you'd like, or nothing. Um, yeah, so, and uh, with this approximation, with uh, the thing that we have on the right-hand side, uh, we can sample uh, this thing, we can sample very efficiently because to sample this object, we only need to sample these random variables and uh, um, because they all will be Gaussian and uh, well, real and imaginary parts will be Gaussian and they all will be uncorrelated. They will all be independent. And then it would be like simply sampling uh, some set of independent random Gaussian random variables and sampling one Gaussian random variable with a particular mean and variance can be considered as a operation which is O of one. So it's a constant number of operations. It's, well, at least I will consider it to be so. So sampling these guys would be really simple uh, because, yeah, so if you recall this F is equal to um, the sum of two Gaussians, and they all are independent. So to sample each of them, we will need only to compute this integral. Uh, and if we know our measure or spectral density in closed form, it's just uh, a question of numerically approximating some integral over some set. So yeah, uh, this is some um, um, idea on how we can sample stationary Gaussian process. But right now it's not clear whether uh, or not what we've built is an actual approximation of the stationary process that we started with. So what I want to do here is to show that at least uh, this approximation uh, converges to the actual process in some sense. So to show that this thing approximate this thing, I want to consider this kind of error. So simply the expectation of the squared absolute value between these two. And um, using the spectral representation of X uh, and uh, rewriting this F of AG as an integral, we get this equality. So just uh, some function integrated over this random measure. Then uh, remembering the isometry property, we get that uh, this, um, this quantity is actually equal to this one. So, and here we don't have any randomness left. We only need to integrate uh, this the same function um, and uh, over this uh, measure mu. Um, yeah, so now to estimate uh, this thing, it's more like um, mathematical analysis kind of problem 
but the main idea here is to pick uh, a reasonable partition, of course. So we don't, we cannot uh, estimate this thing from above without picking uh, a reasonable partition. And then we can, we need to leverage uh, some decay property of our measure mu. So uh, the fact that um, uh, mu of the complement of a growing ball will be uh, decaying to zero. And this is the property that we actually always have in practice. So, yeah. And the main idea uh, to building such a reasonable partition would be for um, specific index uh, j equal to j capital to make uh, a j large, uh, a very large set, but with small measure. So something concentrated around infinity, so to say. And for other j's uh, to make sets a j small, so that uh, this function at point uj will actually be close to this function for u when u uh, belongs to this set aj. Um, also for simplicity, for simplicity, I want to consider right now that the dimension is equal to one and that uh, we have uh, decay property of this kind. So it's uh, it decays polynomially with uh, uh, exponent p. Um, note that without loss of generality, we can only uh, estimate the integral over the positive subaxis because just the integral over the negative subaxis is uh, estimated in the absolutely in the same way. So uh, how can we build the particular partition that satisfies, um, um, that's um, inspired by this idea? So we fix uh, a small epsilon and then we starting from zero, uh, take G minus one uh, segments of length epsilon. So here, here, and to the aj minus one, we have um, um, j minus one segments of length x, uh, epsilon. And then everything else, this very large set will be aj. Now I assume additionally that um, our measure is uh, uh, less than one, so it's finite. So we could have just uh, have some constant here and uh, obtain a final estimation with this constant, but for simplicity, for simplicity, I just assume that it is uh, less than one. And also, and this is an important um, assumption that uh, T is bounded by some T max. So actually this means that uh, we are doing estimation in a neighborhood of some point. Um, and actually, so um, we, uh, the, the, the statement that I want to prove here is actually that we can indeed do, uh, we can indeed approximate the initial stationary process well in some uh, chosen neighborhood, but uh, maybe not that well um, everywhere. So at infinity, it may break, but uh, again, in practice, this is not very interesting to us because we always uh, are modeling not on the whole real line or all on the whole Euclidean space, but only on some, um, for example, cube or something like this. So we're interested in a particular finite set, finite um, set of finite di diameter, for example. Um, so yeah, using this um, particular partition and these assumptions, we see that the integral, this is this integral, it is equal to the sum of these two. Here is the integral over the last set aj. And for this last set, we just use 
that uh, this function has absolute value not greater than one and this one. So this absolute value is not greater than two. And when it's squared, it's not greater than four. So we want to estimate the whole integral by four times uh, the measure of this aj. And here we want to use the closeness uh, of these two. And uh, we estimate the difference between two complex exponentials uh, using the difference between their arguments. And we get this. And then using the fact that uh, how, how we built our partition, we can estimate the difference between u and uj by epsilon and uh, t by t maximum. So we have this estimation. So we are nearly finished um, uh, gathering these things together. We get uh, that we have this sum, sum as a first term and this uh, as the, uh, a second term. Then using our assumption on the decay property of this one, we bound it uh, with the, this quantity. So simply this uh, in the suitable power p. Uh, and here we know that this every term in this sum is the same. So it just gets multiplied by the number of terms. Now we could have optimized this with respect to epsilon to find like the minimum of this and find the best estimation here, but I don't want to do this. I want to just show you that this thing indeed decays to zero. So we can just take epsilon, uh, which is of this order and substitute it here. <coughs> and then um, here we would have epsilon uh, in the power of minus, minus three divided by two plus one. So minus one half, as we see in this term here. And uh, here we would have uh, epsilon and the power of one fourth and uh, in the power of P. So in the end, it would be P to, uh, divided by four here. And obviously this thing decays to zero for G uh, uh, going to infinity. So yeah, um, this thing is indeed an approximation. Uh, and uh, not that this gives a very uh, precise uh, or good estimation on how it approximates the initial process, but um, well, at least we know that it does indeed approximate uh, the initial process. There may be, um, you can do a lot more here, so you can find a better estimation and uh, for example, study how um, and the smoothness of cover a covariance function, uh, how it um, allows you to achieve better estimation here or something like this. So there may be a whole theory built about, uh, around this uh, kind of estimations, but I will not go too deep into this. The important thing that uh, by using this kind of approximation, we can indeed um, sample more efficiently from stationary Gaussian process. So now I want to look at what we've already seen from another point of view. It's the covariance approximation point of view. I suggest to denote this approximation as XDFF, where DFF stands for deterministic Fourier features. And it's Fourier features because uh, we used some kind of spectral representation to obtain this approximation. And it's deterministic for the reason that it's not random. As we will see uh, later, the method called random Fourier features. And um, so, um, never mind. Um, so, this XDFF is a Gaussian process with zero mean, because each, this, each of these random variables has zero mean. Uh, 
and uh, covariance which we can compute and this will be of this form so it's uh, the intensity measure mu um, and uh, here we have this t minus t prime and then if we recall the Bochner theorem uh, it is easy to see that this covariance function is uh, the same uh, kind of approximation of this formula as our process XDFF was an approximation of the formula of the spectral representation of the process itself. So we basically took this integral, um, used some partition of RD, and then approximated uh, the sum as if some functions were constant on some sets. So we could have started actually at uh, just using Bochner's theorem and approximating covariance function. And uh, we wouldn't have to introduce these complex definitions of uh, uh, random measures with uncorrelated values. Um, and the Bochner's theorem machinery is much simpler. The reason why I did um, all this, um, did introduce all these things is to uh, prove some kind of estimation that uh, um, ensures that approximation is indeed an approximation. Uh, but the idea might come from just approximating the covariance function. So, and using this idea, uh, I want to describe another approximation of covariance function and uh, uh, of uh, the Gaussian process that we have. So if we consider the Monte Carlo approximation of the integral, meaning the following, uh, we have this function kappa, which by, by Bochner's theorem is represented in this form. Then we notice that here we have almost an expectation of this function uh, with respect to the random variable, which is drawn to this distribution. So we normalize uh, mu by mu of Rd just to make mu integrate to one. So this would be a proper distribution. And we have, because of this here, some mu of Rd. So this integral is equal to this expectation times this constant. So, um, yeah, and we can approximate this expectation using uh, sample averages. So assume that we starting to sample from this distribution and we just average the exponentials that we obtain. So this is what we have here. Just uh, for some j, we have used this kind of average to approximate the integral. Uh, and this is another approximation of covariance, which I will call KRFF. And here R, uh, RFF is for random Fourier features. And it's uh, Fourier features for the same reason, because we use spectral decomposition. And it's random because um, these exponentials here have random phases. Um, so we have two approximation of covariance and uh, they both correspond to some approximations of uh, the initial process. So uh, KRFF, for instance, corresponds to this kind of approximation where we have uh, these complex um, exponentials times simply uh, some IAD normal uh, random variables, which are coefficients. And obviously it's very simple to sample this one also because we just sample standard normal random variables and then compute this sum to compute a sample of this, um, of this process. And this is just in another form, the approximation XDFF that we have already seen. So here we have this complex coefficient where uh, it's real and imaginary part are Gaussian with known distribution. Uh, 
and it's multiplied by again some complex exponentials only this time we have um, uh, not complex but uh, deterministic phases um, in practice um, the random Fourier feature approach is much more widely used simply because Monte Carlo integration works much better in higher dimensions than um, approximating the integral through Riemannian sums. So uh, this is uh, this could be make uh, could be made rigorous. You can prove that uh, the approximation rate of Monte Carlo integration is, uh, for example, dimension independent, and this is very beautiful and uh, useful result, which can be obtained through central limit theorem. And for, Monte Carlo, for for the Riemannian sum integration, it would heavily depend on the dimension and uh, would give very bad results in high dimensions. So, um, and also for random Fourier features, you could have um, performed the same kind of analysis that we did to prove that approximation is indeed an approximation, only it would be a bit more involved in a way uh, how this process is connected to the how it's connected to the initial process because of all this randomness. Um, I don't want to go too deep here, but well, in principle, you can do uh, the same thing. Um, maybe some questions here. Okay, so let me show you how this could work. Um, oh, so there is some question. Yeah, so um, there is a question uh, from where we get mu and f. Yeah, so we don't get f at all usually in practice uh, it's only needed uh, we, we only need this for some theoretical analysis uh, but uh, this mu uh, we usually have in practice through uh, the density of this measure which is the spectral measure um, which we uh, usually have in closed form because we have some simple covariance and we can compute its Fourier transform in closed form. So spectral measure, uh, spectral density is simply a Fourier transform of the covariance, which we know. So either we can compute it in closed form, either we can approximate it uh, using again some kind of uh, approximation of an integral. Um, so there is no problem with that. And notice that uh, in these formulas here, um, we actually don't have F capital anymore. We only need this WJ random variables and we only need to know their distribution. So to compute this distribution, we need to uh, know spectral density, for instance, or here to sample this SJ, we need to sample from some spectral density. Um, but um, so this is all very much possible. Mm. So what does, oh, okay. So here, yes, this means that SJ is distributed according to this uh, measure. So this is a probability measure. And uh, I want to say that this is, uh, um, uh, every SJ is distributed according to this law. And uh, this IED means, uh, uh, independent, uh, identically distributed. So each SJ for different uh, index of J is independent from other SJs and all, they, uh, all of them are distributed according to the same law. 
maybe some more questions. Okay, so let me proceed. Uh, here I want to show you how this works in practice. So, uh, and first of all, I just want to state explicitly what's the uh, computational complexity of the algorithm that we uh, invented here is. So if we have some L-sized grid, so L points, and uh, we use approximation with J features. So in Riemannian sum, it's, it means that we have a partition into J sets, or in the random Fourier features uh, case, we sample J complex exponentials with some uh, random phases. Um, so in this setting, uh, to sample a Gaussian process on some on this grid of size L, we need O of L times J time and uh, O of maximum LJ space, which is much, much better than um, cubic complexity that we had uh, in that naive algorithm from the previous lecture. So I re remind you that it would depend on the L to the power of three. And here it uh, depends on L linearly. And also in practice, you usually tweak this J parameter uh, in order to um, somehow achieve the best value of the trade-off between the speed and the accuracy of the approximation. And uh, actually the great property of the approximation that we use here is that we don't need grid at all uh, because the samples are represented as linear combinations of complex exponentials. We can store them in memory of computer by just storing their coefficients and uh, think of them as uh, actual functions represented by uh, this linear combination of simple functions, which uh, may be very, very useful, for example, in the optimization where, uh, uh, for example, in Bayesian optimization, which we covered in the first lecture, uh, you may want to use decision strategy based on sampling, that is, you take your Gaussian process and then you sample it, for example, five times. And for each sample, you find the optimum value, optimal, uh, the maximum, for example, corresponding to this sample. And then you uh, run your target function in parallel uh, for these five samples. So in this way, you can do a parallel Bayesian optimization. And um, when your function is a linear combination of very simple functions, you may very effectively uh, optimize it um, uh, and uh, don't lose too much on like inaccurate decision rule that you have, which might be a problem in some scenarios. So here I suggest uh, to consider again this uh, RBF Gaussian process with parameters sigma and L equal to one. And um, so on the left, we have true samples from this process. And on the right, we have samples with uh, random free features for J equal to one. So here with, with some tricks, uh, I got rid of this um, complex exponentials and uh, um, expressed everything in terms of only real cosines and sines. And for j equal to one, we're forced to use only one cosine or sine function to uh, sample approximately from this guy. And uh, yeah, obviously these samples doesn't resemble too much these ones. But what we can see is that uh, as j gets larger, uh, the samples get um, much more um, 
similar to these ones. And actually, so if we take j equal to two, still not very uh, similar. And uh, for this j equal to 32, it's almost the same thing. Notice that these are random samples and these are random samples, so you don't expect them to coincide. Um, rather, you should uh, look at how these functions behave and compare this kind of general behavior between left and right pictures. So actually for j equal to 32, uh, we already have achieved a uh, reasonable convergence. But then if we have even more functions, um, we achieve even better results. Yeah, so that's all for something from uh, stationary Gaussian processes. And now I want to tell you about state, uh, sampling from conditional processes, where prior uh, or unconditional process that corresponds is uh, a stationary one. So why we even have this problem? Um, the problem is that uh, even though a prior process is usually uh, stationary indeed, uh, even for this kind of prior, the posterior process or the conditional process uh, will most certainly uh, be non-stationary. If you recall the conditioning formulas that we had um, yesterday, then um, um, by plugging here sigma squared equal to zero, you can see that uh, in the point where data is located in the point tj, TJ we have this k hat equal to zero. So if we observed uh, some value of the process without any noise, then for posterior process, we know uh, value in this point without any uncertainty. So the variance here is zero. But in other points, uh, we don't know the process with full certainty. And so this thing will be non-zero. So other than in that locations, tj uh, tj uh, we would have this function being positive and uh, as for the brownian motion we get that a variance is different it is in different points and thus the process is not stationary uh, what we could have did is to uh, what we could have done is to um, notice that this uh, rff and dff approximations um, they are very similar to Bayesian linear regression that we discussed yesterday. So uh, this approximation is of this form where all randomness is uh, uh, inside these coefficients. And so what we could have done is to um, condition these coefficients on the data that we have and then a uh, sample from the posterior distribution on these coefficients. So this would be some, again, Gaussian random vector of size j. And thus to do this kind of trick, we would have to um, incur O of j cubed complexity to sample from the conditional process of this kind. Um, this is not very good in terms of time complexity. It's, uh, it may be rather slow for um, a large number of features. Uh, and uh, what's even more important, uh, it turns out that this is uh, not a very accurate method. So in practice, if you have a lot of data, then um, this thing will probably very quickly deteriorate and uh, diverge from the process it approximates. I will show you in the interactive demo in a several slides. So yeah, it turns out um, this approach, uh, though possible, it's not very fast and not very accurate. Um, so let me show you how we can do this alternatively. An alternative way um, is based on the 
on some alternative way of conditioning a Gaussian vector. So return to this setting of x being a Gaussian vector. Now we assume that it has zero mean and some covariance matrix sigma. And now um, let me find the best linear estimator of x1 given x2 in the sense that we are looking for some mat matrix A, which minimizes this guy. So this A of x2 is a linear function of x, x, x2. And we are looking for some matrix such that uh, this error would be minimal. And uh, I will omit the computations here, which are pretty elementary actually, and you can do them as an exercise. But the answer is that matrix A is of this form. So it's this matrix times the inverse of, oh, it's this matrix times the inverse of this matrix. Also as a byproduct of this computation, we get that um, this difference is uh, not correlated to X2. So the thing here for an optimal A is not correlated to X2. Intuitively, it's rather easy to understand because if you, if it would be correlated to X2, then you uh, would be able to uh, devise some uh, linear function of X2 that which you can add here and decrease this further, which is correlated with this thing. But since it's already minimal, you cannot do this. And uh, we have this property. So because of that, we have representation of X1 in this form. Uh, we have this term, which is a function of X2 and uh, this term, which is independent of X2. Uh, so yeah, and basically notice that this one cancels this one. So this is just an X1, very simple. So, and um, this is a very special representation because the following very general lemma holds that if we have two random vectors A and B, and uh, if we have almost surely this representation that A is some deterministic function of B plus some random vector C, uh, which is independent of B, then the conditional distribution of A given that B is equal to beta is the distribution of a vector F of beta plus C. And this is uh, the kind of uh, representation we have here. So F would be the function that multiplies X2 by this matrix. C would be this term here. And uh, Using this lemma, we can obtain the conditional distribution uh, of X1 given uh, that B, which is X2 here, is equal to some uh, value. So in this particular case, we get this formula that random vector of this form is distributed accordingly to uh, the conditional distribution. So what's um, different from what we have before is that we have a particular random vector which has uh, the conditional distribution, not only a distribution, but the particular random vector. And it's uh, a random vector in terms of the uh, prior in the sense that uh, it's a function of X1 and X2 here. So why is this useful? Because this allows us to transform prior samples to posterior samples. That is uh, to sample from this conditional distribution, we can sample uh, X1 hat and X2 hat uh, from this joint distribution of X1 and X2 
and then just plug these into this formula. So we have this x1 hat here and x2 hat here, and return this as a sample from the conditional density. Uh, this is very important because it kind of decouples the process of sampling from prior, which is usually uh, much more simple than the conditional process and from conditioning. So first somehow sample from prior, then update the sample, correct the sample to get the sample from posterior. Um, this trick for sampling with the, with the conditional Gaussian process was many times rediscovered by different people in different uh, scientific communities, but I will call it the Matheron's formula after a French uh, guest statistician, George Matheron, which uh, who discovered this formula like 70 years ago in just statistics. And who thought that this formula is so simple and dumb that he shouldn't ever publish it and uh, write it out explicitly. But his students did, and so I follow them in calling this Matron's formula. Um, so, of course, we can lift this formula to the Gaussian processes. Um, again, through considering um, like uh, arbitrary grid of points and stuff like this, well, the usual thing. And for Gaussian processes, we mm, get this. So the conditional process is equal to the unconditional process plus this correction. Uh, and we may use it to uh, sample from conditional process by first sampling the unconditional process X, this one, uh, for example, with random Fourier features, incurring this uh, cost that we have already seen, and then updating these samples by solving these linear systems, uh, which would require uh, O of n cubed um, for the inverting of matrix or solving linear system, and then uh, L times N operations for evaluating this thing on some grid of says L. Um, and uh, it, costs, it also costs N squared space because we have to store this matrix. So N is the number of data points, uh, is the dimension of data vector. And also here, uh, we don't need grids uh, again. Um, again, so I leave it as an exercise, but you can prove that uh, uh, this XC here, if we sample from X using random Fourier features, it can be represented in the form of uh, uh, some linear combination of basic functions. Only you would require more basic functions to do this. Yeah, so um, here we have the interactive demo. So. Chrome is not letting me. kind of strange. Interesting. Try this. 
some minor technical difficulties from my side and yeah so this is the interactive demo i was want uh, i i want to show you and what we have here is um, the visualization of uh, the conditional gaussian process and samples from it and we have uh, three pictures here is uh, an exact gaussian process uh, exact exact samples uh, evaluated on uh, a fine grid and then interpolated somehow um, and um, um, in this uh, orange picture, we have this approach of using random Fourier features and conditioning their weights. And here um, on the blue picture, we have uh, first sampling with random Fourier features and then conditioning with this Matheron's formula. Um, so what this interactive demo shows is that uh, when we add data here uh, this guy will quickly deteriorate and these two stay okay so already here for these four points you may see that uh, the process in this area doesn't represent well the exact process while the blue process here uh, does a much better job when we add some additional data so for example, you see that the orange process doesn't return here below. So again, not returning below. And the blue process stays very much the same as the green process. So different direction here and here. Yeah. So this, uh, this is an interactive demo which shows that this kind of decoupled sampling through first sampling from priors and then conditioning with this Matron's rule it works much better than, the, than approximating everything with a kind of Bayesian linear regression model and using it to um, process your data. Um, so now I have 10 minutes left and uh, actually the whole um, mm, the whole a lot of things to say about efficient conditioning which I suppose I won't have time to tell. So maybe Mm, I'll skip this and just jump into conclusion. Um, yeah, so maybe you have questions right now on the topics which we have covered so so far. idea from here um, the problem and the main idea so the problem is um, that to predict or sample from a conditioned Gaussian process we need to solve this n by n linear system with this matrix uh, which forces us to have this time and space complexity uh, even with this efficient sampling with the uh, random Fourier features first and Matheron conditioning next, we are still forced to solve this linear system and uh, we still need this cubic dependence on the number of data points. So can we do better than this? Um, yes, we can again by approximating uh, the posterior process somehow. Uh, and the main idea is like this. So if we uh, denote the conditional process by xc as we did before 
Then we can consider some parametric family of Gaussian processes, or rather their distributions, uh, G of gamma, such that, uh, first of all, G of gamma is simpler to predict with uh, than Xc. So for instance, we don't need to solve uh, this n by n linear system. For, we can, um, we, we may need to solve, for example, a smaller linear system uh, to predict with G gamma. Then um, we can approximate Xc by this G gamma in some sense in for some distance D. And also, we may evaluate and differentiate this distance with respect to parameters gamma uh, efficiently on a computer. And then uh, the idea is to use this G gamma instead of Xc um, to do our predictions and actually to sample as well. Yeah, and um, um, the basic family for G gamma, which may we may consider would look, for example, like this. We may consider as G gamma a conditional process, but conditioned on some pseudo data. So we will choose some pseudo locations and pseudo observations and pseudo observation noise. And the number of pseudo locations which will be much smaller than the number of actual data points. So to predict with this conditional process will be much simpler than to predict than with the, with the original process. Um, the main idea is that we, we are trying to find some data of smaller size, uh, which is as expressive as the data that we have at hand. So there is um, another modification of this uh, family. I will skip this for now. For distance, uh, people use KL divergence. Um, and um, yeah, we can uh, indeed efficiently evaluate and differentiate it for the Gaussian process case with the distributions with the approximating families G gamma as I've shown or um, with some others. And uh, people use this scale diver diversions for this reason, actually. So because it's computationally cheap to perform some operations or if because it's computationally even possible to perform them. Um, it's not the best distance, but um, it's attractive because it's tractable. Um, so yeah, we can compute everything. And um, we end up with um, needing to perform um, this S squared times N time uh, for an iteration of optimization over this parameter gamma and uh, S times N space for uh, one iteration of optimization. And since S is much less than N, it's usually no problem. To, to run this for several for several steps to find best parameters. And then using these best parameters, uh, we can explicitly write out the uh, mean and covariance function of approximate process. And uh, we may use these formulas to predict with uh, S cubed time and S squared space uh, costs. And uh, again, since S is uh, much smaller than M, it is much faster. And also um, the special form in which we choose these distributions in practice allows us to do this two-step sampling anyway, because this is still more or less conditional process. So uh, in the end, uh, this leads us to this kind of costs to sample from the approximate conditional process. We have S cubed here. Uh, we have LJ to sample from random free features prior. And we have S times L here 
and uh, we have this memory requirement where we have s squared instead of n squared which is much much less memory so this is the basic idea um, unfortunately i don't have time to go into detail and um, so conclusion what i hope we've learned uh, through this mini course is uh, first what are gaussian processes what are their applications in machine learning uh, how we can predict and sample uh, from them and uh, how to do this efficiently but approximately at least in some scenarios where the prior is stationary which is very often in practice um, so i want to mention that right now in machine learning gaussian processes are really state-of-the-art models for two rather specific uh, tasks so first for small data when you actually uh, don't have a big sample to learn from and um, um, also for uncertainty quantification problems where you uh, need to estimate well how certain or uncertain your model is on some predictions that you ask it to make um, note that there is uh, a whole bunch of practical tools to use in gaussian processes for example this uh, list of python python libraries and uh, there are libraries in other languages um, yeah so many practical tools yeah so uh, i've seen the question i will answer it in a minute um, um, and of course there there is much more to this uh, gaussian process in the context of machine learning that uh, i've told you for instance um i will i want to present a couple of problems which are uh, interesting interested but interesting but uh, completely uncovered by what i told you so first what if we want to do classification instead of regression mm, and um, so this is a problem that can be solved with with this kind of methods the key words to uh, read about these are non-gaussian likelihoods and the main idea is that uh, when you uh, to do a classification with Gaussian processes, you may represent your classification model as some function of Gaussian process, which maps uh, real outputs to uh, outputs from zero to one, for instance, some link function, and then uh, you can still condition this kind of stochastic process, but you will lose uh, the property that posterior process is again Gaussian and can be obtained with this mean and covariance functions of closed form. But what you can do is to uh, use this kind of idea as for approximating process for conditioning uh, to, to consider a parametric family of processes of simple form and to try and approximate your uh, non-Gaussian posterior by, by a Gaussian or a function of Gaussian one. So there are additional applications of these methods. For example, there is this Gaussian process Latin variable model, uh, a dimensional reduction technique based on Gaussian processes, which um, generalizes PCA, kernel PCA, probabilistic kernel PCA, and a whole bunch of other methods. Um, there are more complex uh, Gaussian process based models, for example, deep Gaussian processes or convolutional Gaussian processes. Uh, these deep Gaussian processes compete um, in a way of in, in the field of probabilistic modeling with Bayesian neural networks. Um, and um, there are, of course, theoretical questions which may be the most interesting topic for some so for example um, there are a few results about convergence of uh, bayesian neural networks to gaussian processes 
And uh, with this kind of results, you may want to study how the more complex Bayesian neural networks work by studying the more simple structure of Gaussian processes. And uh, so study the questions of convergence of neural networks, many difficult questions uh, of machine learning, which are still unanswered. You may try to tackle them through the perspective of Gaussian processes being kind of a limiting model, like a normal distribution is a limiting distribution for the central limit theorem. Yeah, so um, that's all that I wanted to tell you, except for the um, details on the approximate conditioning, but we're out of time right now. And uh, now there was a question on what to read um, uh, next. First, uh, I may suggest reading the wonderful book of uh, Rasmussen and Williams, Gaussian Processes for Machine Learning. It's very well written and there are a lot of basic techniques and intuition there, uh, but there is uh, the, the book is very old actually, but it's it's like 10 years old and uh, in machine learning scales, uh, it's ancient. Um, so you may start with this book and then I'm afraid that uh, you don't have any other option than go into reading the papers from machine learning conferences, for instance, for from Journal of Machine Learning Research or, or, th or something like this. So you, um, if you're interested in some particular topic, you can just Google it and probably some paper will uh, come out and you may try to read this paper. So that's basically it. Um, also, you may write me uh, to this email here if you have any further questions if you need any further advice, um, you're mostly welcome to do this. Um, and I, I don't know, maybe for the next five minutes, if you have any questions, you, you may ask me as well. Thank everybody for coming and for staying till the end. This was very interesting for me as well. Thank you very much. <laughs>